Cairo, Seattle. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal, a show about famous people and the stories behind the foods they love most. Today on the program, the last meal of actor, director, and writer Greta Gerwig. Her new film, Lady Bird, that she wrote and directed, just won two Golden Globes on Sunday. This is amazing. Uh, She won for Best Motion Picture in the Musical or Comedy category, and Saoirse Ronan won Best Actress in a Motion Picture, Musical, or Comedy. The movie also received nominations for Best Supporting Actress and Best Screenplay. So this is very exciting because, you know, she's a big winner. I don't want to say that. That's dumb. I'm taking that off. And Greta Gerwig also stars in one of my favorite films, Frances Ha. She's kind of my favorite. It's very exciting for me. So it was extra nice to hear that she has her food priorities straight. My (laughs) true love is uh, is carbon dairies. Carbon dairies. (laughs) And this was a particularly special episode for me because not only did I get to interview one of my favorite actors in person in a hotel conference room, which is so glamorous, you guys. It was the Four Seasons, but it was still a hotel conference room. I also got to chat with my very favorite food blogger, the delightful Molly Ye of the My Name is Ye blog, and she is author of the cookbook, Molly on the Range. Molly and I go deep on Funfetti cake and her massive collection of sprinkles. I could talk about sprinkles all day long. This is a star-studded Golden Globe Award winning lineup. So please get giddy with me. Uh, Prepare to make a grocery store run to get a box of Funfetti cake mix. And let's get started. Greta Gerwig's film Lady Bird is a critic's darling. It had a 100% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, making it the most reviewed film ever to hold a perfect score. So first of all, congratulations on the success of Lady Bird. Thank you. It's it's been extraordinary. It's 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 kind of mind blowing. Yeah. Well, I mean, the internet is not a nice place usually, and so when you get a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes, that is incredible. So, I loved your film. I'm a big fan. I love Francis Ha. But what do you think it is about the film that is resonating with people, getting a one hundred percent rating when that is so hard to do? I think that there is there's so much love that was put into the film by not just me but the the cast and the creative team and everyone really poured themselves into it heart and soul and I'm a big believer that that gets into a movie how much care was taken with it and to 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 get that back obviously f- feels amazing that people are receiving it that way I think that they can feel that it's it's handmade in a way, and it, and it feels that way. And um, and that I think that is part of it. And the other thing is, I think, you know, everybody's from somewhere. Everybody has a family. Everybody understands this. That the flip side of coming of age is is letting go. And I think it's it's resonating with something that's um, you know cross generational. And that's that's incredibly moving because that's what we had hoped that it would do. But you never know. I don't know. You never know. <laughs> Lady Bird is set in Sacramento, which is Greta's hometown, and it's a coming-of-age story about a high school senior named Christine who demands that everybody suddenly call her Lady Bird. The film focuses on the complicated relationship she has with her mother, on her first love, and the oh-so-teenagery tendency to want to make a statement and show the world who you really are. But Greta says the story isn't actually autobiographical. But the foods that she chooses for her last meal have strong emotional ties to family and friends. And I think listening to her talk about her last meal actually does let you in on the kind of person that Greta is. Oh, you know what? I actually, um, my last meal would be, um, it would be, uh, there's a, my favorite food is macaroni and cheese. And my best friend, Sarah Whitman Salkin, makes a macaroni and cheese casserole that's perfect. She always makes a roux with flour. She's explained to me that that's that's the important part of it. And then she does something where it always develops this perfect crust on top. Um, And then there's extra breadcrumbs on top of that. And she's made it for me many times for my birthday and stuff. And um, it's uh, it's my absolute favorite thing to eat. So there would definitely be that. My There's an ice cream company in New York called Ample Hills that makes, I don't even think, it's ice cream, but they make it with, 
I want to say they make it with condensed milk. So technically it's called a custard and it's the creamiest, richest, most effed up ice cream you've ever had. <laughs> it's it's upsettingly good. What's your favorite flavor? Um, there's a flavor called ooey gooey, which is, um, it's like yellow cake batter in ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so those things. I mean, there's probably more, but um, definitely those things. I like that they're both kind of adult versions of childhood favorites. So it's like you have mac and cheese and then you have yellow cake batter, basically. Yeah, that's right. Oh, maybe I could also include in my yellow cake batter thing um, Funfetti cake. You know, Funfetti that you buy from the grocery store, the Pillsbury Funfetti, um, with the cre- they have a cream cheese ice- icing, which is amazing. It's not, like, too sweet. Uh, that cake, too. <laughs> is that something that you had birthdays growing up? Yeah, we always had Funfetti. My mom would always make us Funfetti. It still feels like home. I'm actually weirdly not a huge sweets person, but those that Funfetti cake is so specific. It's like a... It's like a Proustian Madeline for me. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I've seen now people are trying to make homemade versions online, but it's really hard with homemade. the sprinkles. Homemade versions of Funfetti? Yeah. You, that's just, you got to get the box. <laughs> you can't make it healthy. I mean, it's it, like, well, it, you couldn't possibly get all those colors. You can, but it's hard. Really? Yeah. I have not gone down the rabbit hole of Funfetti homemade funfetti but 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 good for them <laughs> for exploring this yeah so did you get to ask what you wanted for your birthday or did your mom just know and she would make that every year or every year was it like what kind of cake do you want uh no I mean I always wanted that cake and that was the cake that was being made it was like both together yeah did you have other birthday traditions in your family yeah I mean we'd always have a there would always be like a family party we we had the you are special today plate do you know that plate no it's a red plate that says you are special today around the outside i think they made it in the late 70s early 80s um they make different sizes of it i have since found one that i can have in my adult life um and you would always get the you are special today plate at breakfast lunch and dinner (laughs) that's awesome so wait now that you have your own do you use it every day no i i i only bring it out on when it's my special day when it's my birthday (laughs) when I am actually special that day that's sweet and so when you use it does somebody usually cook for you on that day or do you just like make your own toast and put it on the plate I just put my eggs on that plate I don't have a cook nobody's cooking for me in that way but um but I use it do you guys know about the you are special today plate Aaron have you ever heard of this plate no I don't know what this is so it's a shiny vibrant red plate that says You are special today in white around the rim, and it says it twice so that no matter which way the plate is facing, you can still read the message. And the font is what I would describe as a Gaelic font, uh, and there's a little flower design in the center of the plate. So the authentic version of this plate is made by a German ceramic company called Weltersbach, and this company was established in 1832. I couldn't figure out exactly when this plate was established, but on the website, this is what they say about the origin of the You Are Special Today plate. I did not expect it to go this deep. (laughs) When some of the first immigrants to America arrived from Europe, this is like a Mayflower story. When some of the first immigrants to America arrived from Europe, they often carried with them few personal belongings. It was common to have very little in the way of formal dinnerware, with the exception of maybe one beautiful, brightly colored plate, which soon became a prized possession. This is where the red plate tradition begins. Since this special plate was reserved for special occasions, it became a way to mark life's important milestones. So, wow. Aww. Uh, But if you want to be like Greta and have a special plate, you can totally order your own You Are Special Today plate online. Okay, let's get back to Greta's last meal. I, I'm not a great cook. I can I can cook, um, but I'm not. It, it's not the thing that I would say. P- p- nobody is describing me as a great cook. Nobody says like the thing you should know about Greta is she's a great cook. That's never happened. That's never been uttered. But um, but because I just I love it as a way of showing love, and I love it as a as a gift, and particularly my friend Sarah who who always makes me the macaroni and cheese. My birthday's in August. It's August 4th. And it's a bitch 
to make macaroni and cheese casserole in the middle of August in New York when it's hot. And it says that, you know, you can have a wall unit of air conditioning, but it's going to be really hot in that kitchen. And I would think it's such a generous thing and that she, she does that. And she also, one of our other friends had a baby, and she just brought over just so much food that she'd made that it could all just be, like, warmed up, and it was easily easy to make and um, I think it's a nice way to show love. We all need a Sarah. I know. Actually, we all do need a Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> this one goes out to you, Sarah. I know. <laughs> she knows we. She knows how I feel. <laughs> when I Googled your name and just the word food, um, all that kept coming up was that you shared a, a Thanksgiving recipe this year, your oh, dad's yeah. stuffing. Yeah. Oh, God, that's got to be part of my last meal, too. Oh, the last meal is just getting more carby. Mm- well, that's my <laughs> true love as yes. uh, as carbon dairies. Um, I, yeah, yeah. That 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 that. He just came to New York and um, with my mom and for Thanksgiving they uh, he made it and he, so he made that recipe again. Um, it's the Julia Child recipe. It's always it's got olives in it, which is unusual for stuffing. And people always say mm, olives, <laughs> which is um, which is great. And, but it's 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 the Best and it's always so exciting when it starts going, and then I'm always stealing bites from it as it's cooking. Is it green olives or black? Black olives. Oh, that's even more rogue for some reason. I know. Get ready. Uh. Make that recipe. <laughs> no, it's so good though. What else is in it? I saw sausage. There's sausage. It's I, there's sausage. There's there's some chopped up capers, which I don't like regular capers, but I don't mind it in this. I mean, it's the regular bread and everything else. It's a lot of onions, garlic. I don't know. I mean, I just chop stuff and put them in. Because you're the best cook in the world. I'm the best helper mm-hmm. and the best eater. My dad is a good cook, actually, and my mo- but my mom and I are like the sous chefs where we prepare everything, you know, on cooking shows where they always have bowls of things just ready. Oh, yeah. We're the people making the bowls of things. They call it mise en place. What is that again? Mise en place? Yeah, that's like when you see cooking shows and there's all the tiny bowls. It, yeah. I think it might mean like everything in its place or something like that, but it's like being super prepped. Place, I see. Yes, that's sort of how I suppose the Blue Aprons arrive. Yes, everything yes. in its place. Yes, yeah, exactly. Blue Apron is French for everything in its place. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. The yeah. just the little known fact. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it breaks my heart to have to say this to you, Greta, but we already did a macaroni and cheese episode. Celebrity librarian Nancy Pearl also wanted a gooey cheesy macaroni and cheese casserole for her last meal. And she makes a recipe from the joy of cooking. So I recommend you listen to that episode if you haven't already. But for this episode, we are going to focus on the classic late 80s, early 90s boxed birthday cake, Funfetti, a white cake chock full of rainbow sprinkles. When we come back, we'll chat with Molly Ye, the incredibly creative, talented, and Let's face it, adorable. Am I allowed to say that? Lady behind the blog, my name is Yay. Molly makes fun fetty cake from scratch. And you guys, sometimes she even makes the sprinkles from scratch. Fun Fetty is coming your way right after this break. Greta Gerwig wants Pillsbury's Funfetti cake as a part of her last meal. It's classically a white cake freckled with rainbow sprinkles that hit grocery store shelves in 1989. And this cake matched perfectly with the puffy painted and hyper-colored t-shirts that we wore to the birthday parties this cake was often served at in the early 90s. Now, I call them sprinkles, the colorful little ding-dongs that you find in this cake, but on the East Coast, they are often called jimmies. And I once worked with a Kiwi who told me that they're called hundreds and thousands in New Zealand, which that is my favorite. I like that one the best. I've never heard that before, but I grew up in New Jersey. And to me, yeah, they're Jimmy's. Jimmy's. Uh Were they always um, rainbow Jimmy's or were the chocolate ones Jimmy's too? Both. Okay. All right. So Greta is fond of the original Pillsbury Funfetti that came in a box, but creative bakers out there are doing homemade versions of Funfetti. And one of those queens of cake is Molly Yeh. Her blog is called My Name is Yeh, and it is my absolute favorite. 
you know when you like something online and you like just kind of go to it every day and you're like, is there a new one yet? And then you get mad when there's not as if this person should be superhuman and and create new cakes every day just for you. That's my experience with My Name is Yay. Her writing is effervescent and playful and thoughtful, and her cakes are so creative and original, and they're just a style all of her own. You have to frolic over to My Name is Yay after you listen to this podcast uh, and take a look at her cakes. And one of the things that I really like about Molly's work, which is something that I admire in Julia Child as well, is that she is a tireless tester. So when Molly was developing a Funfetti cake, she tested nine different kinds of sprinkles, just the sprinkles alone, in order to perfect her homemade Funfetti cake. So I was adamant about getting her on the podcast. When I was driving to work today, I was thinking about this interview and something came to me. I thought, you should be a sommelier because your name is basically is sommelier. Sommelier. I have thought about that. You I'm have. Actually, so my older sister, she a few years ago took her first test in order to become a sommelier. And we were just joking about how it'd be like, we got like the wrong names. Like she should have been Molly because she could be sommelier, Mollier. Totally. But- <laughs> Excellent branding opportunity. Wasted. Right? Right. Well, are you ready to talk about Funfetti? <gasps> yes, I'm so excited. I know that Funfetti was a big part of your childhood. Can you talk a little bit about that? All of the best birthday parties had a Funfetti cake and they weren't like layer cakes. They were a sheet cake usually made from the box. And um, that was like the gold standard of birthday cakes, I feel, for any child who grew up in like the late 80s or 90s. I think the generation is key because I was talking to some people my mom's age and they didn't even really know what I was talking about. Well, yeah, it's um, gosh, hold on. Can I do a quick Google search to see or maybe, you know, this like when Funfetti was actually invented? I Sorry, know I this. Heard. It's 1989. Oh, my birth year. OK, yeah. So that's that makes a whole lot of sense that wow, you share a birth year with Funfetti. That makes it even more special. That's a sign. That's totally a sign. <laughs> So you grew up eating Funfetti, and then now that you are an expert baker, you decided to take it on yourself. What is the key to making a successful Funfetti cake at home? Because you had a lot of trial and error. Yes. So there are a few very important elements about a Funfetti cake that's made from scratch. And the first thing that I want everybody to know that I feel like is kind of a misconception in the world of cake baking is that... Funfetti cake is not just sprinkles in a vanilla cake. It requires a specific type of sprinkle because not any type of sprinkle will do. I tried a lot of like naturally colored sprinkles. And then I really wanted to do a type of Funfetti cake that used found objects like fresh herbs for the green or freeze dried berries for the red or um, different seeds that could add, you know, fun, different natural colors. And those, for the most part, either got brown in the oven or sunk all the way to the bottom. Um, I tried to use uh, sanding sugars, which the color just melted out while it was baking. And then same thing with nonpareils, those itsy bitsy little balls that are really bright and really crunchy. Um, Those were just too small. And also trying to think what else, you know, what worked really well was homemade sprinkles, Um, And then the best ones, though, the best and the easiest ones to use are those cylinders that you get from like the ice cream sundae section. They're just like your basic cylindrical sprinkles that are brightly colored and they're artificially colored as well, which is important. Now, those what the reason that those are important is because those are going to retain their color in the batter, like during the baking process. Those are going to be the brightest. Now, the cake is the other element that's important, obviously, because when you have a bunch of these colors dispersed throughout the cake, you want them to be bright and you want them to pop against a bright white cake. So it's not just any old vanilla cake because a vanilla cake is going to be slightly yellow. It's going to be more like a yellow cake. Um, And so in order to make the brightest white cake possible, it's important to number one, use only egg whites. Um, So no egg yolks. And then when you Uh, take away the egg yolks, you're going to take away some of that richness. So I combated that by adding oil. So so just like a clear flavorless oil, which added more fat, uh, took the place of the egg yolks, and then also, but it didn't add any color to the cake. Um, And then another thing that's like 
that does kind of two jobs is using clear imitation vanilla. And number one, that's not going to add that brown color that like a natural vanilla would add. And then at the same time, it's also going to add sort of like that nostalgic flavor that was so unique about the boxed Funfetti cake. Oh gosh, I could keep going <laughs> talking for hours about this. But um, uh, another thing that's important is that you have a like an even dispersal of sprinkles. So when you cut into the cake, I had a, f- a few test runs where I would cut into it and then the sprinkles would just sink all the way down to the bottom. And that was really annoying. Um, and so that that required me to play with the consistency of the cake batter. For this, you're definitely going to want a butter-based cake because it's going to add the butter flavor, but then it's also going to create a thicker batter that's going to suspend those sprinkles in a much more even manner. So hearing how hard it is to get it exactly right homemade actually makes me have a lot of respect for Pillsbury now because you just think, oh, it's just this box cake. They really had to figure out how to make this work at home just from a mix so that the sprinkles dispersed evenly and all that. Yeah, and I once heard this hilarious thing about cake mixes. And I don't know if this was true specifically for Funfetti, but when cake mixes came out, apparently all you needed to do was add water. It was too easy for people. So it didn't sell very well. And then when they added a few more steps, like add the oil and the eggs, suddenly it was like people could have more ownership over making this cake and they didn't feel like it was such an easy way out. I love the psychology behind people really feeling like they want to be a homemade baker, but not actually making it homemade. But that's really fascinating. Semi-homemade. You love sprinkles so much that you incorporated them into your wedding. Yes. So after we tied the knot and as we were doing our processional, well, when most wedding guests would throw rice at um, the couple, our friends threw sprinkles at us. We made little individual packets of rainbow sprinkles. And even like a year or two later, you could see random little rainbow sprinkles in the cracks of the the ground on the farm. You always keep quite a sprinkle collection. How many or how many types do you have at any given time? I um here, well, I guess I could just walk over to my sprinkle collection. Um, so sprinkles are like my favorite souvenir to get whenever I go traveling because even just like a grocery store generic sprinkle in another country is going to be different. So I'm looking right now, I have, um, I have some sprinkles from Italy and they're a lot longer and skinnier and there's a lot of pink in them. I have some from Israel and I'm kind of just doing a rough estimate. I don't know, probably like 20 to 25 jars of sprinkles are here and out of them probably about 15 are stale and bad, but I just love looking at them. And I read that sprinkles do really well on Instagram. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, anything with color, anything that's fun. And, um, and I think in the past few years, there have been so many more things on Instagram and on blogs that have been fun fedied. Um, so like fun fetty scones, fun fetty bread. I have a fun fetty biscotti recipe that I love making because it's just kind of like an easier, more casual way to enjoy your sprinkles and, and colorful food, you know, so it's not just adding sprinkles to something, but you also want to make sure that you're adding that clear imitation vanilla, because that really is kind of the flavor of a nostalgic fun fetty cake. Yeah. On that note, I told Greta about you and that you make the cake from scratch. And she was both confused and a little bit horrified. She was like, no, no, it only can come from a box. That is the way it's supposed to be. So I was wondering if the homemade version tastes like the box or is it too good? Oh my gosh. First of all, I'm like really happy that you said my name in Greta Gerwig's presence. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, um, and, and maybe, maybe she'll like one day allow me to make her a homemade fun fetty cake, but okay. I, I do think about this. I think about how, you know, special the boxed cake was to our childhood. And that, that's why that, that clear imitation flavor is there is because it has the flavor. Um, but one thing I like about the, the fun fetty that I make is that it's just slightly denser. So it gives you a little bit more to to sink your teeth into. Um, I think the flavor is amped up a little bit more. 
my number one goal when I'm making cakes is that they've got to be moist. Like a dry cake is my biggest fear aside from death. But (laughs) (laughs) so, so, so it is moist. It is really flavorful, but I think the texture is a little bit more satisfying than the boxed cake. I can I'm sorry, tell, I can tell from the pictures on your blog how moist it is and how dense it is and that it looks so good. Like I got a little drooly in my mouth just looking at the Yay! pictures. Yeah. Success. Success. Because yeah, that's the thing with the box cakes. They are always very fluffy. So fluffy. And it's almost like you're eating too much air when you're having a bite of it. And you, this is just a way to get more in your mouth at once. More calories, less air. Exactly. Oh, God. What was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So you've made your own sprinkles. How do you make sprinkles? Oh, they're easy. They just take a lot of time and a lot of space. It's essentially royal icing. So you just mix egg whites and powdered sugar and then whatever food colorings you want. And actually, if you want to go full on all natural sprinkles, this is the best way to do it because you can buy like all natural food coloring and then you know, you, you color your egg white and sugar mixture, and then you put it into a piping bag with the teensiest, tiniest little piping tip. And you pipe out, well, you could either do little lines, lines are probably the easiest. And then once they dry after a day, you cut them up. Or if you have like a lot of time on your hands, or if you want to sit in front of the TV and pipe out itsy bitsy little dots, you could do that. Is it worth making them or did you just do it because you like to make the effort to make everything from scratch? I mean, if you like that type of thing, it's totally fun. You know, it's relatively low maintenance for like what you're getting. I don't know. I like I I don't do that for most of the funfetti cakes that I make. I will use store-bought sprinkles and I buy sprinkles in bulk these days. Um, But you know, if you really want to go that extra mile, it's just, it's fun to be able to say like, oh, I made these sprinkles. Or another thing you could do, I don't know how well this would work in Funfetti, but a few years ago I made cayenne sprinkles, just added a little bit of a kick and you put those over chocolate ice cream and it's really, really tasty. Of course, when something old becomes new again, when something vintage becomes modern, we often like to put new twists on it. So I wanted to know what Molly saw for the future of Funfetti. You know, I think the future of Funfetti, and don't steal this idea, anybody listening, (laughs) is like different flavors of sprinkles, incorporating maybe different spices into sprinkles, and sort of fusing the line between a sprinkle mix and a seasoning mix, or like a sprinkle mix and a duca, and adding nuts and different flavor cardamom seeds maybe and like sesame seeds things like that I think that's That's, genius I could totally Uh see a bagel with instead of the seeds on top having sesame seed and poppy seed flavored funfetti like a savory funfetti on a bagel that would be so good let's do it and so cute is there a way to have the base not be the royal icing so it wouldn't be so sweet hmm that's a good thought yeah almost like well yeah, you could do the seeds and then, I don't know, maybe like baking something, like making almost an itsy bitsy cracker could oh, be yeah. a solution to that. You know, my aunt has a freeze dryer. Maybe we could just freeze dry a bunch of stuff and see how it funfettis. I like how you said we, because like, I'm going to totally come over and we're just, I'm just going to pop on by. <laughs> we're going to have gonna a funfetti walk. party. Yeah. Yes. A savory yes. funfetti party. I love that. Molly, <laughs> thank you so much for chatting with me about funfetti. This was so fun. Fetty. Thank you. <laughs> I am very excited by the idea of savory sprinkles. And in a New York Times article about funfetti, Molly A once said that sprinkles are the perfect garnish, kind of like parsley for desserts. We are going to take a quick break, but when we come back, more with Greta Gerwig. She'll tell us about her recent first magical meeting with Justin Timberlake. Greta Gerwig's Golden Globe winning film, Lady Bird, is set in 2002 Sacramento. So Greta wanted to get a bunch of popular music from that time to play in the film. 
I loved reading about all of the personal notes that you sent to the musicians of whose music you wanted to use in the yeah, film. Yeah. Uh, Dave Matthews. Alanis Morissette and uh, Justin Timberlake. And I also wrote a letter to um, like Ani DeFranco and Steve Sondheim and Steven Sondheim, I don't call him Steve. I just use that like as if he and I, I I've never met him. But yeah, I, I mean, I wrote all these le- letters to really like try to explain to them what, what the movie was and explain why I wanted to use the music because, um, you know, they, they, they have to give approval, obviously, of, of letting you use their songs. And it was set in such a specific time and place. And I thought that the music could really help draw the audience into that. Did you get personalized letters back or did you get like letters from their people? No, I never got letters back. I just heard, yes, they're fine with it, which is like all you really need. You just wanted Justin Timberlake's signature and he would not give that to you. No, he would, he, he withheld it, but I got to meet him. So yeah, yeah I got to meet him um, a couple weeks ago and it was very exciting. And he obviously remembered that he gave me permission to use his song and I said thank you very much in person. He wasn't uh, coming over to sue you? No, no, we were at the same event and I um, very dorkly went up to him and said, Mr. Timberlake, uh, thank you. And he said, call me Justin. (laughs) Actually, he might not have said that. That might have been just a thing I made up in my head. I think he said, call me Justin. In my mind, he said, call me Justin. In my mind, when you said it, he turned around like in slow motion and no. looked over his shoulder and said, call me no. Justin. No, no, no. It wasn't that. It was me being like, oh, thank you so much. And him being like, don't thank you. And you're wonderful. And he was, he was very kind. I think every good interview ends with Justin Timberlake. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Nice to talk to you. And that was Greta Gerwig's last meal. Her fantastic film, Lady Bird, still might be playing in a city near you right now. Since it just won a Golden Globe, they're keeping it in theaters. And, you know, it might be up for some Oscars as well. So go see it. I also recommend checking out the film that she stars in, one of my favorites, called Francis Ha. Big thanks to Molly Ye, who is the author of the cookbook Molly on the Range, and the blog My Name is Ye. Her cookbook, just like her blog, is so whimsical and delicious. You should get a copy right now. And thanks to you, the listeners, for sharing your last meals with me. Hello, my name is Derek. I'm from San Diego, California. For my last meal, I would want sushi and mac and cheese. The reason I chose these two is because they're both comfort foods for me. This is Tim Sheridan from Kansas City, Missouri, and for my last meal, I'd have some baby back ribs and mac and cheese. Hello very much. I am Leif Van Pelt of Taylorsville, California. My last meal would be seven or eight authentic street tacos from a tiny ramshackle, locally frequented taqueria that plays loud Mexican music in their kitchen and serves their tacos with limes, radish, and a few selections of salsa and a jalapeno and escabache. They would definitely have no onions. Because if my last meal included onions, I would end up in hell since onions are grown by the devil himself and are his to reclaim post-mortally. Gracias, amigos. I want to know what your last meal would be. I really do. I'm so curious. Uh, Get out your phone, record a quick little message. Just say your first name, where you live, and what you want to eat for your last meal, and email it to yourlastmealpodcast at gmail.com. Oh, and while you're fiddling around on your phone, subscribe to the podcast. Leave a review. It actually does make a difference. This episode was produced by Aaron Mason and me, and our theme music is by Prom Queen. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal. Her new film, Lady Berg, that's how I say it. (laughs) Greta Gerwig's film, Lady Berg, Greta Gerwig's film, Lady Berg, is her fantastic film, Lady Berg. (laughs) Whoa. It's so weird. It's so weird. weird. Can you give me that again? You said Lady Berg. I did? (laughs) I keep wanting to say Lady Berg. It's so hard. (laughs) Greta Gerwig's film, Lady Lady Bird. Lady Bird. Ah, ah. (laughs) Greta Gerwig's film, Lady Bird. Gerwig? Gerwig. Gerwig. (laughs) This is crazy. Gerwig. Gerwig. Yeah. Okay. Stay for the end of the episode where you can hear... (laughs) Cut footage of Rachel's stroke.